topic this evening, as you know, is infinity, and infinity raises all sorts of interesting philosophical questions. But in fact, um, my plan this evening is to focus on the more mathematical aspects of the topic rather than the philosophical aspects. I'm going to start with this simple diagram. And you can see that this is a diagram in which there are some uh, men and some houses. And I want to start with a very simple question about this simple diagram, which is whether there are as many men in this diagram as there are houses. If you think about it, actually there's already something a little strange going on here. Because what do you mean? What does David mean? What does anybody mean when they say that there are five men in this diagram? Or that there are five houses in this diagram? Well, we've got these numbers. One, two, three, four, five positive integers that we use to count. And that's exactly what we've done in this case. We've used these integers to count the number of men and to count the number of houses. So what we're saying when we say that there are five of each is that there are just as many men as there are positive integers from one to five. And that there are just as many houses as there are positive integers from one to five. And that's absolutely fine. And that is a way of determining the answer to the original question. But if you think about it, it's a circuitous way of determining the answer to the original question. We started off with two sets, the set of men and the set of houses. We wanted to know, basically, whether those two sets were the same size as each other. We've answered that question perfectly reasonably, but we've answered that question by introducing a third set. And in effect, what we said was, well, yes, these two sets are the same size because they're both the same size as the third set. And although it's a perfectly reasonable way of answering the question, it's a roundabout way of answering the question. It's as if you had two men in front of you, uh, let's call them Arthur and Bill, and you wanted to know whether Arthur and Bill are the same height as each other, and you drag in off the street a third man, Christopher, and you line up Arthur against Christopher, and yes, they're the same height as each other, and you line up Bill against Christopher, and yes, they're the same height as each other, and you conclude that Arthur and Bill are the same height as each other. Well, that's fine. That's a perfectly good way of answering the question. But the thought must occur to you, couldn't I have done this directly? Surely it wasn't necessary to bring a third person into the reckoning in that case. And in this case, surely it's not necessary to bring a third set into the reckoning. So, let's forget about the positive integers. Let's go back to the original diagram and let's ask the original question. Are there as many men in this diagram as there are houses? And see if we can answer it without counting. It must be possible. It must be possible. It must be possible to do it directly. Well, one way in which we could answer this question directly without going via the positive integers would be by adding lines to the diagram, like so. Pairing them off with each other. Now there's more than one way to do this. I mean the particular lines that I've added are not the only way in which I could have paired them off with each other. But the crucial thing is that by adding these lines I've shown that it is indeed possible to assign a man to each house and a house to each man in such a way that corresponding to each man there's exactly one house and corresponding to each house there's exactly one man. Or a very um, simple way of putting it is that it's possible to pair them off with each other. And it's the fact that it's possible to pair them off with each other, intuitively, which dictates that those two sets are the same size. When you count, when you introduce the positive integers, all you're doing, in effect, 
is going through that same procedure. You're saying, one, two, three, four, five, it's possible to pair off these men with the positive integers from one through to five. But we didn't need to introduce them. We could have got there directly by showing that it's possible to pair the men and the houses off directly. And it seems intuitively as if that's what it is for two sets to be the same size, or for two collections to be the same size. It's for it to be possible to establish this kind of correlation, to pair the elements of the two sets off with each other. So, for example, just to give you another example of this kind of principle in operation, I now don't know how many people there are in this room. I've got a rough idea, I know it's more than 20 and less than 100, but I don't know exactly how many people there are in this room. And uh, nor therefore, I mean I could find out, I could count, but, but as, it, as things stand I don't know. Nor, therefore, do I know how many left legs there are in this room. Nor do I know how many right legs there are in this room. But here's something that I am confident of. There are just as many left legs as there are right legs. And the reason that I'm confident of that is that they can be paired off with each other. Corresponding to each left leg, there's one right leg, corresponding to each right leg, there's one left leg. Incidentally, I should say, this is a talk that I've given a number of times before, and this is the point in the talk, at which I'm always slightly nervous. <laughs> but, but I think I got away with it. <laughs> As, to be fair, I always have done. Um, so... Uh, the first point that I would um, try to impress um, on you is, is this point that we seem to have this intuitive sense of what it is to compare collections in size with each other. It's to be able to establish this kind of correlation. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, well that's all very well, but what does that have to do with infinity? So, let's reintroduce the positive integers. One, two, three, four, five, and three dots. And the three dots are crucial. Uh, they indicate the thing that is itself crucial about the positive integers. One of the very first things that you come to appreciate about the positive integers, which is that they carry on indefinitely. There is no such thing as the largest positive integer. This is a sequence that never ends. It's an infinitely long sequence. So here we begin to see infinity finally coming into the reckoning. Now, suppose that we didn't just consider the positive integers, but considered specifically those that are even. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, etc. And once again I need to put those three dots in because the even numbers themselves carry on forever. There's no such thing as the largest even number any more than there is such a thing as the largest positive integer. Now you can probably see from the very way in which I've um, represented them, the very way in which I've drawn the diagram, that there's a little bit of a paradox in the offing because obviously we can do the very thing that we did with the men and the houses, which is to say we can pair these off with each other. Corresponding to each number n, over on the left hand side, there's the number that is twice as big, the even number that corresponds to it on the right hand side, and conversely, corresponding to any even number, there's the positive integer that is exactly half that size. So what have we got? We've got a way of pairing off all the positive integers with those specifically that are even. And what we were saying earlier was that if you've got a way of pairing off all the members of one set with the members of another set, then that's tantamount to saying that the two sets are the same size. 
So if we were to apply that principle in this case, then we're forced to conclude that there are just as many even numbers as there are positive integers altogether. And yet, of course, there's another sense in which that's very counterintuitive. There's a powerful intuition pulling in the other direction saying, well, no, that can't possibly be right. How can there be as many even numbers as there are positive integers altogether? Because the numbers on the left-hand side include all the even numbers plus more besides. So we've got, we've got intuitions pulling in opposite directions. We've got the original principle that we started with telling us that these two sets are the same size. We have another intuition telling us, no, there are fewer even numbers than there are positive integers altogether. And this is just one example of very, very many paradoxes of this kind. We could have done just the same thing, for example, by considering square numbers. One, four, nine, sixteen, twenty-five. Again, the three dots are crucial because, again, there are infinitely many of them. And here we write n squared. And again, we have the same paradoxical situation that it seems that we have to admit that there are just as many squares as there are integers altogether, while on the other hand, there's a strong intuition telling us no, there are fewer. And the squares, in a way, the paradox is even more striking than it is in the case of the even numbers, because at least in the case of the even numbers, if you'll pardon the pun, they're scattered evenly um, through the sequence of numbers. I mean, every alternate number is an even number. But with the squares, as you travel out along the sequence of positive integers, these are getting rarer and rarer. You encounter them, as it were, less and less frequently. The gaps between them are getting bigger and bigger. So, you know, way out there, there are going to be stretches of positive integers where there are millions and millions of them without any squares appearing. And yet, even so, we have this way of pairing them off with all the positive integers. So for the time being, I just want to think of that as a paradox. I mean, what we have at the moment is just a puzzle. Um, I haven't said anything just yet about how I propose to um, solve this puzzle. But before I do, I just want to mention a couple of other examples. Uh, these examples, the ones on the um, previous sheet, were arithmetical examples. But there are also uh, geometrical examples that we could have considered that are just as puzzling in their own way. So imagine, if you can, that these are two concentric circles. I'm not very good at drawing circles, as you can see, but um, please exercise your imagination and um, suppose that those are two concentric circles. There's the common centre. And suppose the question that we want to consider now is whether there are as many points on the shorter circumference as there are on the larger circumference. Or we simply want to compare those, those two sets in size with each other. The set of points on the shorter line and the set of points on the longer line. Well, we find ourselves in exactly the same position, that it's very easy to show that they can be paired off with each other. And all you need to do to establish that is shoot rays out from the centre. Um, there are going to be infinitely many of these rays, and corresponding to any point on the larger line, there will be a point on the shorter line where the ray passes through the inner circle. And conversely, corresponding to any point on the shorter circumference, there's the point on the larger circumference where the ray finally hits the outer circle. So that's just the same sort of principle as we were considering in the arithmetical case, 
except that this time it's a geometrical example. But it's also a counterintuitive example, just like in the arithmetical case we have an intuition pulling in the other direction, we think, well surely there must be fewer points on the shorter line than there are on the longer line, because it's shorter. How can there not be fewer points on the shorter line than the longer line? So intuitions pulling in opposite directions. Just one more example, the last example, and then I'll tell you how I propose to deal with these puzzles. The last example is again a geometrical example, and this is perhaps in its own way the most puzzling of all. Um, imagine if you can an infinitely long line which extends infinitely far in both directions. So it's shooting off to the left and it's shooting off to the right um, indefinitely far. And we can imagine that we have uh, numbers assigned to all the points on the line. So somewhere in the middle, whatever we mean by the middle, um, is a point to which we assign the number zero. Somewhere to the right of that, there's the number one. Somewhere to the right of that, there's the number two. As you travel left, you have negative numbers. So somewhere to the left is the number minus one. In between zero and one, you've got a half. A little bit further on from three, you've got the number pi. All of these numbers have points corresponding to them. All of the points have numbers corresponding to them. And this is, as I say, supposed to be extending infinitely far in both directions. So these positive numbers are getting infinitely large, and these negative numbers are getting indefinitely small. Do I mean small? Negatively large, whatever the correct way to phrase that is. Um, now, consider the, this little segment between zero and one, and let's make a copy of that segment above the entire line. So there's, that's a bit right near the middle of the line, which we've copied up above, the stretch between zero and one. And what I want to do now is to ask the question, are there as many points on this little segment as there are on the entire infinite line underneath? And again, believe it or not, it's possible to show that there are. And the way to do this, it's a little bit like what was going on with the concentric circles. It's another geometrical trick. You take that segment, the little bit between 0 and 1, and we make a third copy of it, although this time we bend it into a semicircle. OK. And there's the centre of the semicircle, so you've got a little smiley there above the line, and we just do the same sort of thing as we did with these two circles. We shoot rays out from that point down to the line below, and that is enough to show that corresponding to any point on the entire line below, there will be a point on this little segment, and conversely because each of those rays will pass through the, the um, semicircle and hit the line below. Now, um, so far, so mathematical. This is the point at which it pe perhaps begins to get a little bit more philosophical, because at this point, the question arises, well, what, do, what are we going to do about this? We have a puzzle, we've got a paradox, we've got these cases where we're inclined to say one thing and we're inclined to say something else, and we're left wondering quite what is the best way to describe the situation. Well, it is largely a philosophical issue, um, and there are various things that we could say. One thing that we could do is say, well, this just goes to show that the whole idea of comparing two sets in size is just inapplicable in the case of the infinite. 
It works perfectly well where finite sets are concerned, but as soon as you start trying to apply those principles to infinite sets, the machinery just breaks down. And, and what these examples go to show is that we just shouldn't really be talking in these terms. We shouldn't even be asking the question whether these sets are the same size as each other or not. That would be one possible reaction to the paradox. Over at the other extreme, I mean there's lots of intermediate cases, but over, over at the other extreme is the reaction that tends to be the reaction of mathematicians themselves. The standard mathematical way of broaching these paradox is to rest with the original intuition. We started off with that very powerful intuition which told us that two sets are the same size if it's possible to pair the members off with each other. And what mathematicians do is they say, well that served us well in the finite case. Let's stick with that. Let's continue to apply that principle in the infinite case. And if it means that there are just as many even numbers as there are positive numbers altogether, so be it. It's counterintuitive, but a lot of things in mathematics are counterintuitive, and it's just a, um, a counterintuitive result that we have to live with. That's, that's the reaction that most mathematicians would adopt. And indeed, rather than see it as paradoxical, what they do is they turn these anomalies to their advantage because what a mathematician will actually do is say look we have the wherewithal here to define the infinite we can say look a set is infinite when this kind of anomaly arises if you can pair off all the members of some set with the members of one of its own subsets that's what it is for a set to be infinite. So um, far from treating this as a paradox that we need to run, run away from, run scared from, mathematicians take it in their stride, accept these results, and as I say, capitalize on them and, and typically use this as a way of defining what they mean by infinity. And so far, you might think, so good. And indeed, um, if this talk was to stop at this point, which I'm sorry to say it's not, <laughs> but if it were, you might go away thinking, well, actually, that wasn't really all that puzzling. I mean, there were some results that initially looked a little bit counterintuitive, but it's not a particularly deep in, uh, uh, offence to our intuitions, because surely really all it's doing is demonstrating that all infinite sets are the same size. And in some respects, that's intuitive, not counterintuitive. You have all these distinctions of size that you can draw in the case it sets. But when it comes to the infinite, who would have thought that some infinite sets were bigger than others? Isn't the intuition that all infinite sets are the same size? And isn't that what we've demonstrated? That would be a very natural reaction and certainly that would be the reaction that you would have, as I say, if the talk was to stop at this point. But I'm sorry to disappoint you, the talk is not going to stop at this point, because here comes the really surprising bit. It's possible to show that some infinite sets really are bigger than others. Not all infinite sets are the same size. So far, we've considered cases where infinite sets do turn out to be the same size. But what I would like to do now is I'd like to try to convince you that some infinite sets are bigger than others. And if it were not for that fact, if it were not for the fact that there are these different infinite sizes, 
The branch of mathematics which is known as transfinite mathematics would be the merest shadow of the subject that it in fact is. Uh, there is such a thing as transfinite mathematics, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about it later, and it trades on the fact that there are these different infinite sizes. So my next task is to try to convince you of that. I want to try to argue that there are cases where you cannot establish a correlation between two sets. It turns out that one set resists being paired off, or the members of one set resist being paired off with the members of another. And we want to, to, to demonstrate this, we, we need to return to the positive integers. One, two, three, four, five, etc. We've already been talking quite a bit about these, and they come back into the reckoning. Now, as well as the positive integers themselves, there are sets of positive integers, and we've been talking about them as well. We considered the set of even numbers, for example, and also in passing I mentioned the set of square numbers. And there are infinitely many of those. There are infinitely many sets of positive integers. Um, I mean, I take it that's reasonably obvious, because apart from anything else, for each positive integer, there's the set that just contains that positive integer. So there are infinitely many sets of positive integers, just as there are infin infinitely many individual positive integers. And what I want to do, the, the, the two sets that I want to compare in size with each other are those two sets, the set of sets of integers and the set of integers. And I want to try to convince you that there are more sets of positive integers than there are individual positive integers. That's the aim of the exercise. Now, first of all, before we go any further, one thing that we need to note is that intuitively a set of positive integers can be represented by an infinite sequence of yeses and noes. So the even numbers, for example, could be represent, would be represented by the sequence no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. Alternately, you're finding numbers that are even and they're alternating with numbers that are not even. The set of squares could be represented, would be represented by the sequence yes, no, no, yes, etc. So for any set of numbers, you could think of it as a, an infinite sequence of yeses and noes telling you whether successive numbers did or did not belong to that set. So that's important for, for what's to come. Now, I want to imagine somebody who thinks the opposite of what it is that I'm about to try to prove. I want to imagine somebody who thinks that it is possible to pair off the positive integers with the sets of integers. So if somebody comes along and says, oh, you know that, you can do that, just as we were pairing off infinite sets before, no problem. So we say to this person, okay, how does it go? So let's imagine that down here on the left-hand side, we've got the integers again. One, two, three, four, five, etc. And what this person is claiming is that they can assign a set of integers to each of these in such a way that, as it were, by the time you've finished, finished in inverted commas, all the sets are there. So what's going to happen is that each of these numbers, each of these integers, is going to be paired with a sequence of yeses and noes, telling you whether or not successive numbers do or do not belong to the set. So we say to them, OK, come on, uh, show us what it is that you have in mind. 
And let's say, for the sake of argument, I mean, this is just for the sake of argument, the devil will be in the detail, but let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that they are wanting to pair the number one with the set of even numbers. Got to start somewhere. So, okay, no, yes, no, yes, no, etc. So far, so good. Uh, number two, number two, let's say, gets paired with the set of squares. Yes, no, no, yes, no, etc. Uh, number three. Well, um, there's two cases that we must make sure that we include at some point. There are the two extreme cases. Uh, the empty set, which is an infinite sequence of no's. Um, it's a limiting case, but it is technically a set of numbers, and it's got to be in there somewhere. This diagram is supposed to include all possible sequence of yeses and no's. So let's put that in next. No, 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 no. An infinite sequence of no's representing the empty set, the set that doesn't contain any of the integers. And indeed, over at the other extreme, we'd better make sure that we've got the full set. Uh, an infinite sequence of yeses has got to appear at some point. So let's put that in at number four. Uh, number five, the set of primes has got to crop up somewhere. So why don't we have that corresponding to number five? Uh, no, yes, Yes, no, yes, etc. Now, as I say, the details don't matter. I mean, this is completely arbitrary. The point is, it's got to happen somehow. Um, every single possible sequence of yeses and noes has got to appear in this diagram. But this person imagines that that is possible. They may think they've got a recipe, they may just be envisaging it in some abstract sense. But at any rate, they think that it is possible. So to fill in this diagram, if only you had infinite time, in such a way that every possible sequence of yeses and noes appears in the diagram. And what I want to now argue is that whatever they come up with, I mean, if this is indeed how it looks at the beginning, or whether it looks some completely different way at the beginning, whatever they come up with, we have the wherewithal to show them that the project has been a failure. It is not possible to complete this diagram in such a way that all possible sequences of yeses and noes appearing in it. The point being that we can always take the diagram and find a sequence of yeses and noes that has been left out. And as long as we're always in a position to do that, as long as we're always in a position to thwart their plan, then their aim of establishing a pairing um, is doomed to failure. And the way that we do this is as follows. Uh, this is um, a, a diagram that is extending infinitely far to the right and infinitely far down. And what we're doing is we're looking in effect at the top left-hand corner of this infinite diagram. And we go right to the top left-hand corner, that no up there, and we travel down the diagonal. And of course, this is going to be an infinitely long diagonal because the diagram is extending infinitely far to the right and infinitely far down. So we have this infinite diagonal that we're journeying down. And as we travel down that diagram, we ourselves are encountering no's and yeses. And what we do as we um, undertake that journey is Every time we come across a no, we've got a little pad in front of us. Well, no, not a little pad, a big pad, an infinitely big pad <laughs> in front of us. Every time we come across a no, we write down yes, just to be perverse. And every time we come across a yes, we write down no, just to be perverse. So what we're doing is we're travelling down the diagonal and we're writing down the opposite of what we encounter each time. So in this particular case, what we find on our notepad begins yes, 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 
no, no. Those are the first five entries in this record that we're keeping of our journey. And uh, so this is an infinitely long sequence of yeses and noes. And just like any other infinitely long sequence of yeses and noes, it represents a set of numbers. In this particular case, it's a set that includes one, two, and three, because it begins with three yeses. It excludes four and five, because then there are two noes. Now, you've got to remember, the aim of the exercise was to ensure that every possible sequence of yeses and noes was included in the diagram. And what I now want to argue is that we've found a sequence of yeses and noes which is not included in the diagram. This sequence that we've written down isn't anywhere in the original diagram. Now, why am I so confident of that? How can I be so sure? Well, we know for sure that it's not the very first thing in the list because we've deliberately constructed it in such a way that it won't be the very first thing in the list. It differs from the very first thing in the list in its very first position. There was a no there and we wrote down a yes. So irrespective of what else is going on along there, it's not the set that comes in at number one in this diagram. But neither is it the set that comes in at number two because we've deliberately constructed it in such a way that it won't be. There was a no there in the second position and we've written down a yes in the second position. So again, irrespective of what else is going on in the diagram, it's not the set that comes in at number two in the list. And it's not the set that comes in at number three, and it's not the set that comes in at number four, etc, etc, etc. How do we know that it's not the set that comes in at number 612? Answer, because whatever else is going on, it differs from that set in its 612th position. If there was a yes originally in the 612th position of the set that was numbered 612, then there's a no in that position on the set that we've written down on our pad. So we've we found a set which wasn't included, and that was irrespective of what we started off with. Now this person who's convinced that it is possible to establish a pairing off here might be undeterred. They might say, oh gosh, okay, well I missed out, yes, 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 no, no, but I'm going to squeeze it in anyway. Right? <laughs> yes, 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 no, no. So they put it there right at the top and they say, no problem, uh, and we just slide everything along one, right? So that's now the set that corresponds to number one. And the set that did previously correspond to number one now corresponds to number two. And the set that did previously correspond to number two now corresponds to number three. How's that, they say. But of course, it's absolutely hopeless. We've got a recipe here that we can apply irrespective of what they come up with. So there's absolutely no obstacle to us just starting over again. And we've got a new diagonal, and we travel down this new diagonal, and we do exactly the same as we did before. We write down no's every time we come across yeses. We write down yeses every time we come across no's. And once again, we're in a position to show that their attempt to pair these things off with one another has been a failure. So there's yet another set that doesn't belong to the new diagram and therefore didn't belong to the original diagram either. And the only possible conclusion is that it isn't possible to pair off the individual numbers with the sets of numbers. And that in turn means that we have to conclude that there are more sets of positive integers than there are individual positive integers. Those are two sets that are not the same size as each other. There are at least two different infinite sizes, two sizes that infinite sets can be. Now, you'll be relieved to hear that I am now close to finishing, but there is a little more to say about this. Um, no, there's a lot more to say about this, but there's a little more that I am going to say about this. Um, because what I just said was that we are now in a position to conclude that there are at least two different infinite sizes. 
but at least two is the operative phrase there. In fact, it turns out there are infinitely many different infinite sizes. Um, one reason for that, I mean, there are lots of different ways of reckoning with that fact, but one reason for that is that this argument that I just went through can actually itself be repeated indefinitely. And just as we were in a posi position to show that there are more sets of integers than there are individual integers, so too it's possible to establish that there are more sets of sets of positive integers than there are sets of positive integers. And there are more sets of sets of sets of positive integers than there are sets of etc. So these infinite sizes are themselves increasing indefinitely. There are infinitely many different infinite sizes. And um, we can assign numbers to them. I mean, just as we do in the case of finite sets. In the case of a finite set, you can say how big it is by specifying a corresponding positive integer. That was where we started. That was our starting point when we said that there were five men in that original diagram. We were saying how big the set of men was by assigning the number five to it. And similarly, if the question arises, how many Gospels are there in the Bible? Um, we can give the answer four. We're assigning the posit positive integer four to the set of Gospels in the Bible. That's what the positive integers enable us to do. They enable us to measure how big sets are. Well, similarly, similarly there are infinite numbers that enable us to say how big these infinite sets are. Are. And it turns out that the set of positive integers that we've been focusing on so much, it turns out, I'm not going to prove this now, I'm hoping that you'll take my word for this, but it turns out that that's the smallest infinite size. Any infinite set is going to be at least as big as that. You can't be infinite and get any smaller than that. Um, and the number that is used as a measure of that particular infinite size, the smallest infinite number, um, is uh, they use a letter from the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, to um, uh, give names to these infinite numbers. And that particular infinite number is called Aleph Zero. And there's a, um, a subscript there, zero, to register that it's the smallest infinite number. Now, I'm afraid I'm not very good at drawing Alephs. There are probably people here that can draw perfect Alephs. But it looks, I don't know, a little bit like that. Um, and then there's the little subscript zero to represent the fact that that's the smallest infinite number. And then it turns out, and again, it turns out is the operative phrase. This is something else that I'm hoping that you'll accept on trust because I'm not in a position to prove it. But it turns out that they get bigger in discrete steps. I mean, that's not obvious. Fractions don't get bigger in discrete steps. There's no such thing as the next biggest fraction after a half. But infinite numbers do get bigger in discrete steps. So the next one is Aleph 1, and then there's Aleph 2, etc. And there are infinitely many of those. And you can do arithmetic with them. They can be added, and they can be multiplied, just like finite numbers. Although, I say just like finite numbers, uh, actually the mathematics is a little bit less interesting than it is in the finite case. I mean, for example, you might think, well, if you add Aleph 7 to Aleph 5, you perhaps get Aleph 12, do you? Uh, but actually, no, it doesn't work like that. In fact, if you add Aleph 7 to Aleph 5, you get Aleph 7. What happens is that Aleph 7 is so much bigger than Aleph 5, it kind of swallows it up. And the Aleph 5 is just immaterial. I mean, it's as if you tried to um, add a finite number to Aleph zero. I mean, adding a little bit of finite stuff just doesn't make any difference. And so similarly with these infinite cardinal numbers, infinite numbers, when they're added together, the arithmetic is not 
so interesting. Aleph 7 plus Aleph 5 is just Aleph 7. Similarly, as far as multiplication is concerned, you might think that Aleph 7 times Aleph 5 would be Aleph 35, but no, it doesn't work like that. Aleph 7 times Aleph 5 is just Aleph 7. It's the same principle all over again. The Aleph 7 is so much bigger than Aleph 5, it doesn't care if you try and multiply it by Aleph 5. It doesn't make any difference to it. It's there in its huge splendour, overshadowing Aleph 5, and you just get back Aleph 7. So um, addition and multiplication are not very interesting uh, in the transfinite case. Exponentiation is a little bit more interesting, but that really is the point at which I'm going to stop. Although, of course, if anybody has any questions about the exponential case, I'll be happy to address them. Thank you.